Hey everyone, Kaijin Kumbi here, and welcome back to another episode of Witch Samurai. And, uh, yeah, I think we can all agree that it's about time we talk about today's topic. What? You mean the fact that we're finally covering a Yakuza game? We really have slept on this franchise, huh? There's been Yakuza 0 through 6, Kiwami, Judgment, Like a Dragon. In fact, the franchise itself is changing its name to Like a Dragon, with Ishin, Gaiden, and 8 coming out later this year and next. That's a lot of material to work with. Actually, I'm more excited to talk about the period of history that Ishin represents. We've talked a lot about Samurai during the Heian period, Muromachi period, and Sengoku Jidai period, but we've never really gone in-depth when it comes to the twilight years of the Samurai in the Edo period leading up to the Boshin War. And while it's not nearly as long, glorious, or ripe for fantasy interpretation as the other periods, it's still a critical point for the warrior class. And Yaku, uh, like a dragon, Ishin perfectly captures what makes that period of time so important by showcasing the life of a single samurai. A samurai who would act as a major catalyst that would change Japan forever. Ryoma Sakamoto. Who? You might be thinking? Ryoma Sakamoto. I know he's not quite made the rounds in the West alongside other legends like Uesaki Kenshin, Takeda Shingen, Tsunada Yukimura, Yasuo Tokugawa, Oda Nobunaga, or Toyotomi Hideyoshi, but believe it or not, Sakamoto's incredibly well-known and well-loved in Japan. In a 2008 survey via the NHK Broadcasting Cultural Research Institute, folks in Japan were asked their favorite historical figures, and Sakamoto ended up being in third place, only behind Oda Nobunaga and Yasuo Tokugawa. So I find it interesting that a Yakuza game of all things retells the life story of Sakamoto. Ah yes, the true life story of the man who became a legendary fisher, buyo dancer, udon chef, streaker, sake drinker, wood chopper, strip rock paper scissors player, chicken racer, bullet hell romancer, and karaoke singer. Never mind the fact that that last one wasn't even invented until 1971, but yes, let's talk about the true to life tale of Sakamoto Ryoma. All right, let me clarify. This is a Yakuza game, so for those of you who have never played one, to say that the games have a loose grip on the real world would be more than an understatement. It's just part of the charm. However, that being said, I don't think that changes just how well this game tangentially teaches about the state of the country, its people, samurai of the time, or Ryoma himself. In fact, despite how goofy and out of touch Ishin can be at times, I think it does a surprisingly good job at biographizing his life and what makes him so important to samurai history. So let me set the stage really quick, and before I get started, quick spoiler warning, we're going to be talking about a lot of the plot of the game, but nothing too specific that it would ruin the experience. So, it's 1853, and you know what that means. Knock knock. It's the United States. Yeah, Matthew Perry just rolled in and, uh... You're gonna open up the country or what? Jeez, Japanese folks are so stubborn. I'm seriously tired of waiting. It doesn't go well. Japan is forced to end its Sakoku isolationist policy, and the Shogun is forced to sign the Convention of Kanagawa, a supremely one-sided treaty in favor of the US, which showed the people just how cracked the armor of the Tokugawa Shogun it had become. This gave the revolutionary ire of the southern... western? Uh, territories of Choshu, Satsuma, and Tulsa, the Han, or Domain, that the game starts us out in. Now, one might think that Perry kicking Japan's door in and Tokugawa Yoshinobu bowing to US pressure was the only reason there was dissension with the samurai, but that really isn't true. Perry was just a spark. The powder keg, as it was, were the people's exhaustion and disillusion with the samurai-focused caste system that had been prevalent in Japan for over 200 years. The strict hierarchy system of the samurai and the abuse that it fostered had finally superseded its responsibilities in protecting the people in a lot of ways. But man, in Tulsa? Dude, Tosa at this time had been suffering so much worse than other places. Tosa had become so strict in the enforcement between the Joshi high-ranking samurai, the Kashi or low-ranking samurai, and the Nomin or peasants, that they were physically segregated in residential areas. And the first thing that Ishin establishes in its world is exactly this. Not only is there a great deal of discussion involving the various ranks of the Joshi and the characters' disdain for the system's existence, we actually see this dissension happen. A woman is desperate to get her daughter to a Dutch doctor due to an appendicitis, but the local Joshi utterly refused to let her pass. And it's here we're introduced to our stone-faced heart of gold protagonist, Kazuma Ki... Uh, Yoma Sakamoto, who quickly dispenses with these two thuggish Joshi, allowing the woman or daughter to pass by, showcasing that sick nasty fencing school training he got in Edo. Did you know about that? Sakamoto got fencing training in Edo. In Edo, you guys, he got trained there. Yeah, the game does kind of bang on and on about Sakamoto's Edo-based Kenjutsu training, but it's kind of important that it does. 
because not only did the real Sakamoto do the same, but it was also how he became so active as an Imperial Loyalist. Despite being a Goshi or country samurai, Yoma's family was actually pretty well to do. They owned a business in both brewing and fabric on top of their stipend as a samurai family, so they were able to send Yoma to the Hokushin Ito School of Swordsmanship in Edo. Yeah, that tragic backstory that we get in game, it didn't really happen. Ryoma had become incredibly skilled in swordsmanship at that time though, which is very much reflected in this game's combat. In fact, by the time he went back to Tulsa in 1854, he soon turned right back around and went back to Edo in 1856 for more training and to become a teacher of swordsmanship himself, just in time to feel the first aftershocks of Perry's arrival and expose himself to the Sono Joey movement to remove the Shogunate and re-establish the Emperor. And speaking of combat, I absolutely cannot neglect to bring up Sakamoto's fighting styles in this game. Granted, we have the aforementioned Kenjutsu as well as the Brawler build, cause let's be real here, it wouldn't be a Yakuza game without a Brawler build. However, we have two other styles, Gunman and Wild Dancer. Now I can promise you that Sakamoto never performed any sort of gunfu in real life like he does in game. However, matching his personality of modernization, Sakamoto of the real world was rarely parted with his Smith & Wesson seen in art pieces defending himself from assaulters. So despite how outlandish this combat is, the fact that Sakamoto is dual wielding a pistol and a blade is actually more historically accurate than you might think. Where Sakamoto got his hand cannons though, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't given to him by his stepbrother like what happens in game. And it's here we gotta pull in Ishin's other big players in the early part of the plot, Takechi Hanpeta and Toyo Yoshida, for they too were true to life historical figures. In the endgame, Takechi is a sort of step-blood brother to Sakamoto who together revere Toyo as a pseudo-father figure. As for Toyo, he's committed to end the hierarchical samurai system that plagues Tosa through Takechi and Sakamoto. Takechi thus becomes the head of a new loyalist party of a few thousand samurai whose goal is to force the current government to change. However, before Toyo's grand plan could come together, he was assassinated by an unknown figure who Sakamoto vows to find and wreak vengeance on. All right, I gotta stop you right there, cause this is where the game starts to take some massive liberties. First, Takechi wasn't Sakamoto's stepbrother, but rather just a friend, while Toyo was never Sakamoto's father figure. Now, I'll give the game credit. Takechi Hanpeta did in fact organize a Tosa loyalist party called Kinoto, a Sono Joey Reformation organization of about 2,000 low-ranking samurai who insisted on the reformation of Tosa's government. However, the Tosahan daimyo, Yamuchi Toyoshige, utterly refused to recognize the group. So in response, the Kinoto group planned to assassinate Yamuchi's governor, Yoshida Toyo. And they were actually successful in pulling it off, which is completely contrary to the entire inciting incident of Ishin. And while both in-game and real life Sakamoto and Takechi would separate due to a conflict of ideals, in reality, Takechi only wanted revolution for Tosa, while Sakamoto wanted revolution for Japan. Compared to what actually happens in game with these two characters, isn't that a massive misplacement of history? Well, to those of you who played through Ishin's story, I have to ask you, was this aspect of the game really that different? In either case, this is where Sakamoto left Tosa without authorization. Yeah, something to bear in mind is that before the Meiji Restoration period, people were not allowed to travel without permission from the government under penalty of death. But that didn't stop Sakamoto. He took on the alias of Saitani Umetaro as he began to help plot against the Shogunate. And man, where have we seen that plot point, right? This is all very similar to how Sakamoto in-game took on the alias of Saito Hajime to further investigate the mysterious circumstances of his father figure's death. Now this is where the differences between Yoma Sakamoto of Ishin versus real life really start to go off the rails. The rest of the game is focused on Sakamoto's investigation into Toyo's assassination through a very different, but honestly, historically believable route. But while Sakamoto in-game would find himself entangled with the Shinsengumi government police, Sakamoto in real life was surprisingly even more involved and outlandish with his activities. By 1864, the Tokugawa Bakufu government was cracking down on dissenters really hard, so Sakamoto fled for the neighboring Satsuma Han, another major centerpiece for the Sono Joy movement of expelling barbarians, removing the shogunate, and putting the emperor back in the seat of power. And it was here that Sakamoto made one of his life's greatest achievements, the formation of the Satsho alliance between Satsuma and Shoshu. Historically, these two territories had always been at each other's throats, but Sakamoto, as a neutral party, was able to end the feud between the two territories and form a pretty massive military force that could challenge the power of the Shogunate. 
I know the Yakuza games are all about underground political intrigue and power, which, granted, Ishin does have, but for the life of me, I have no idea why they didn't use this part of Sakamoto's life as a massive plot point in the game. I thought it would have fit in extremely well. Well, Kazuma Kiyu never was a catalyst of underground intrigue, but was rather a player trying to reconcile his place within it. So it probably would have been a bit of a tonal whiplash for Kiryu, aka Sakamoto, to do something that grandiose, despite the character he's stepping in the place of. Then, fair. I suppose it would also be pretty weird to have Yoma, not Kiryu Sakamoto, form a minor naval fleet mirroring what real Sakamoto achieved later on in his life. Then again, another interesting parallel I did find is that later on in his life, Sakamoto did channel his parents' flair for business and started a shipping company that doubled as the above-mentioned naval fleet. While in-game, Sakamoto starts a small business selling crops and wares to earn cash, so I don't know, I think it all could have worked as the story actually went along. I mean, Yakuza 6 had Kiryu starting a massive street gang in the clan creator, and like a dragon had Ichiban form massive businesses and staff, so I don't think a side activity of forming a tiny naval fleet would have really gone amiss in Ishin. But I digress. Another thing that could have fit in really nicely in this game was IRL Sakamoto's 8-point plan for modernizing Japan's government. The plan that, in the long run, was accepted by Tosa's leader, Goto Shoujiro, who then used his power to push it all the way to Tokugawa Yoshinobu. From there, Yoshinobu stepped down and Sakamoto's plan was actually used in the formation of the Meiji Restoration. Told you the samurai was important for the time. And maybe it would have been strange if Ishin Sakamoto was to do this straight face, but it could have been created through one of Yakuza's quaint accidental success stories that the franchise is so well known for in its side quests. Sadly, at the age of 31, Sakamoto Ryoma was assassinated, though there were actually multiple attempts on Sakamoto's life prior to that, one of which took place at Teredaya Inn in Kyoto, which, yeah, that very inn is a central location for Sakamoto in-game where much of the story revolves around, so that's a nice little nod. But it was actually at Omiya Inn in Kyoto where Sakamoto would meet his fate. Members of the Shinsengumi who first backstabbed Sakamoto's bodyguards ran up to the guest rooms and took Sakamoto and his associate, Nakaoka Shintaro, by surprise, fatally injuring both of them before running off. And don't worry, this actually isn't a spoiler because it's this Omiya incident that we actually see at the very, very beginning of the game. Which prompted us, as I hope it does you, to try and figure out what the heck is actually going on considering who's talking, who's wearing a Shinsengumi outfit, and... Yeah, there's a lot of weird intrigue to pull apart based on this one cutscene. While this does wrap up Sakamoto's story, it doesn't wrap up the numerous connections between Sakamoto of Ishin and Sakamoto of real life. For example, in-game we come to find that Sakamoto takes on an adoptive daughter named Haruka, an obvious nod to the Yakuza series. Well, Sakamoto in real life also had an adoptive child, a son named Taro. Yeah, but there's also a few massive conflictions between the two Sakamotos. For example, in Ishin, there's a side quest where a heavily mustachioed foreigner is being warned about the growing Sono Joy sentiment with the local people, which may put his life at risk, which he just dismisses. Sakamoto then goes out of his way to make sure the guy doesn't end up dead in a ditch. Sakamoto of real life was very much on the side of the Sono Joy movement, and I don't think for the life of me he would have actually gone out of his way to protect some random foreigner who probably represented the enfeebling of his people to him. So, I don't know about this one, Chief. Well, fans of the game, what do you all think? Is Ishin Sakamoto a fair comparison? Are there other comparison examples that we missed? Let us know in the comments below, and a big thank you to Sega for giving me a copy of this game to look into. Greatly appreciate it. And if you want to learn even more about Japan and other world culture through your favorite games, anime, and movies, sub up and be sure to check out our channel page every other week for a brand new breakdown video. Also, be sure to join us every Tuesday, Saturday, Sunday on Twitch. But until next time, everyone, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.